it's lovely to be here. Uh, nonetheless, we'll try to keep the, the session interesting. My name is Adrian. I'm a product manager at Canonical for managed services, and I'm not here alone. No, I'm Andrea Montano. I'm AIML and uh, MLOps product manager at Canonical, the publisher of Ubuntu, in case you're wondering who we truly are. <laughs> and there are colleagues. <laughs> Well, today we'll talk about, guess what, MLOps and how open source enhances it, and more importantly, what is the role of operations, of course. And I'll start with the use case of one of our customers that inspired this talk from the telco industry, um, because it's one of the leading industries when it comes to machine learning. Um, they wanted to do, or they're actually a router producer, and they wanted to optimize the, the waves or the directions of waves within a router and between the data center and the router. There are more than 2 million devices around the world that would use this technology. And the challenge that they came up with was actually related to how do we connect the technology from the data center to the edge device, which is not really an edge device because it's quite a big router. And when it comes to how much or, um, work they were running, they had more than 800 weekly experiments and quite a large team that needed to work on such an infrastructure and such a project. Furthermore, the challenge that they added to was the number of GPUs. They had a huge cluster of more than 300 GPUs. And more importantly, they were coming from different silicon vendors. So what they were looking for was actually a solution that could run on all of them, whether it's NVIDIA, Intel, AMD. They wanted to use the same software stack, and they wanted to operate it seamlessly and get, if possible, the best performance regardless of what they are using. Now, while working with them, we identified some interesting challenges that also apply to other organizations. They had the use case very well defined, but at the same time, they had it defined very theoretically and they struggled scoping it in order to understand what is the actual performance that they could get. And whereas this is the intuitive, if we look at the tools that are available on the market, I like to say that it's a bit of a zoo. There is a new tool coming out every day, a new framework that promises the best performance. And the truth is that tools are actually not well integrated. And data scientists at this point, I think, still spend more time on tinkering with the tooling rather than building machine learning models. But data scientists don't care that much about the security and compliance. That's what our sec the security experts care about, CISOs care about, when they want to productize machine learning projects. And whenever we talk about ML projects, there are a lot of packages dependencies that come up with vulnerabilities. And beyond that, you, you need user management. You need network isolation, for example, as well, which are things that influence the operations. And these two put together leads to a lack of machine learning architecture standards. I talk to a lot of customers, and they all have a different idea of how their architecture should look like. Well, in addition to that, there is a clear talent gap on the market. I remember there were more than 200,000 jobs on Glassdoor related to ML at the beginning of the year. Everyone is hiring data scientists. They have astronomical salaries, yet no one finds the right talent. We have the same problem in Canonical as well. Well, all these challenges put together lead to a slow time to market, and it translates really, really to business leader into a lack of return on investment of AIML projects. So is it really worth investing in AIML? And furthermore, how can we accelerate such a challenge? And before we jump into answering those questions, we really wanted to take some time to understand the operational issue from a time to market perspective. So generally speaking, in, in this context and in the context of AI projects, time to market is this line. It's what connects the idea to the minute the idea is turned into a revenue producing product. So that can come with a plethora of dimensions from design to wireframing to well coding and testing and then you code and test again and whoop, you code and retest again and then generally this part right so from the minute you kind of understand what you have to code to the minute you test and retest and retest and retest that is a very operationally vulnerable moment in your time to market journey because you need to reach a level of operational efficiency otherwise you're risking doing these steps wrong and harming both your long-term revenue and your performance in the market in the long run. What does operational excellence look like? Let's take a look. 
If operational detractors to time to market are solved by operational excellence, in the context of AI, this materializes in a few things. Well, you're right. And I'll start with the um, optimization of operations themselves. So whether I talk about tool integrating different tools together, and there are simple examples such as Jupyter Notebook and MLflow, but also going further, integrating tools within an enterprise context, get job schedulers integrated in your Kubernetes cluster, for example. In order, if as long as operations are optimized, project delivery is going to happen much faster. But then we need to bear in mind also scalability. We start small with one server, two servers, or maybe you even start on a public cloud. But as your project matures, you're actually going to end up having a need to scale your projects, get more clusters, or maybe even migrate from one cloud to another. Ideally, you should do it in a smooth manner and also with as little operations as possible. Now, going further, security and compliance, again, it's not the first thought of anyone, to be fair, but it's actually crucial whenever it comes to thinking and optimizing your operations. If you need to spend too much time creating users or isolating your finance data only to have access to for part of your data scientists, then you're losing from the get-go. And last but not least, reliability. Assuming you have a smart, or going back to the, our use case, actually, assuming uh, you have such a use case, you don't want your routers not to show, not to work anymore just because the tools in the data center failed, right? So achieving operational excellence in AI really transforms into a couple of things, security, reliability, portability, and last but not least, scalability. And why does it, is it important? Well, I'll start with the company. As an organization, you want actually stable environments. And if they are not there, you don't want that. We, we have every other day organizations and business leaders complaining about different tools being unstable. But then also, you don't want delayed project delivery. If you agree on a timeline, you should be able to keep up to that. And you don't, because otherwise you don't see return on investment on your project. Security is important, and it's important on one hand to protect your data, which we're going to talk very soon about. It's the heart of any organization, but also to talk about your artifacts. There are very few people talking about the security of the models. How do you package them? How do you ensure that they are not being accessed or poisoned as well? And last but not least, you don't want wrong or misleading conclusions that business leaders use in their decisions. Now, going to the data, Data itself, let's go back to the, Sorry. there we go. My mistake. G going back to the data, it's the heart of any AML project, but also is the most valuable thing that most of the companies have. And you should protect it on one hand and clearly control the access of it internally, but also to ensure that nothing from external sources can access it. Monitoring for data drift, for example, is one of the important things that you should do as part of your operations. And last but not least, at the moment, a lot of the processes are manual, whether we talk about integrating tools, upgrading them, or even in introducing new processes that are not needed, it is not good. It leads, in the end, to delayed project delivery, to slower pro time to market. So. I'm going to do something. I'm going to break down operations. It's the boring part. You know, everybody kind of overlooks what operations are, but I'm excited about them. You know, it's my job. But it's, it, 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 I think there is a fun way to actually think about them. And, and I'm going to start from here and kind of work my way there in a little dance just to make it more exciting for everybody. So first of all, it's business as usual. Everything is running smoothly. Your systems are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Your models are training. Everything is well. We're all happy. We need to keep an eye on our operations through very good monitoring. So you measure a set of metrics against the schema that you have, you make sure that everything is within parameters. You have an alerting system that tells you when a certain metric is outside of those parameters. That helps you decide what you're going to do with that. And also probably when you start your AI infrastructure, you're going to set some limits for your workload and training models to scale within, right? So the, 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 the training part can scale just up to this point. Otherwise, whether I'm in a public cloud or on-premises, I'm going to run out of resources. All good and dandy. Planned events is when you make sure that everything will work and will continue working as it should. So it allows business as usual to be continuous, to, to repeat itself. So this is done through upgrades and patches, which we're going to see in a minute in a larger ecosystem can be a little bit tricky because you have a lot of tools. Then you have infrastructure scaling. So you scale within the parameters, but there might be a point where your parameters are no longer enough. You're either training larger models or you're looking at 
reducing or increasing your, your infrastructure significantly. You will need to have a plan to how you increase that without affecting your current workloads. And finally, if you need to migrate, which does happen through various business dynamics within the market, you need to also have a plan and a protocol to do that without um, affecting your models and without affecting your data quality. Finally, something breaks, something happens. Everybody hates it when this happens. Nobody wants to think about it. Oh, let's put our heads down. We do need to think about it. You do need to have some incident recovery protocols and some bug fixing practices that you apply all the time so that when something does break, the engineers or the people in charge don't think, oh my god, oh my god, this is on fire, what do I do? But they actually just apply the protocol and then they don't waste time and this maximizes your efficiency. And obviously, this materializes in a set of troubleshooting uh, practices that, that are essential to, to keep track of. Now, let's look at what does it mean when we look at an AI ML stack. And we all, it all starts with the hardware. I know it's, it's not maybe obvious, but you have different types of hardware vendors, different types of GPUs, and then you can go further to D DGXs, DGX clouds, and so on. They all have an operating system, and it, it's often Ubuntu. But more importantly, in the operating system itself, you need to integrate different drivers that are optimized for each of them. You need to integrate different operators, such as the GPU operator or the network operator, to ensure the performance of it. And then you need to test and validate it. You need to ensure the smooth upgrades and updates, what Adrian just mentioned. In order to assess or to enable the rest of the stack, as we go up on the stack, you need a bare metal solution or provisioning solution for your cluster. And it is very interesting that you need a provisioning tool that is actually scalable because you, again, you start with two GPUs, but in two years from now, you're likely that you're gonna have 100 GPUs. So it should work as well. And last but not least, then you add your container orchestration layer, Kubernetes, whether it's from one official distribution distributor or it's vanilla Kubernetes. Kubernetes is essential when it comes to machine learning operations. And I know ML engineers don't necessarily like Kubernetes. They don't necessarily have experience with it. But it defines and it can make or break any ML project. When it comes to the Kubernetes itself, on one hand, again, you need integrations with the GPU operators. And you have to bear in mind that you have one for each of the, of the silicon vendors, for example. But also, you need network operators to ensure the performance of the network. You need GPU schedulers, such as Volcano, for example, that is featured uh, in one of the rooms upstairs. And then you also need compatibility between tooling, which is maybe often the tricky part, because one Kubernetes distribution can work with one GPU operator, and you need to have a support matrix that fully works on such an ecosystem. Now, we can finally go to the fun part, which is really the machine learning lifecycle and the machine learning operations. Ideally, organizations and also developers would like to use one solution, because otherwise they go back to the tooling fragmentation challenge. And all these tools need to run on Kubernetes. They're often cloud native applications. And as examples that are widely adopted on the market, you have Kubeflow, you have MLflow, for experiment tracking, for example, you have Jupyter Notebook as part of Kubeflow, but then you also have pipelines which are used to automate machine learning workloads. Yet, developers don't only build models, they also want to optimize them. They wanna do fine tuning, they wanna do hyperparameter tuning, and for that, on one hand, you use tools such as Katib or Knative, you, you can use Mindspur, for example, but then also depending on the, on the hardware underneath, you can use different frameworks, and what comes to mind is ITEX and IPEX, which are uh, Intel's optimized uh, libraries for um, PyTorch and TensorFlow. And last but not least, you would like to deploy models. Again, on one hand, you have different deployment frameworks that are optimized for different hardware, such as Triton Inference Server, but then you can also use KServe, or you, can, you should access them through KServe. Now, all these solutions need to be, of course, upgraded, updated. They need to be secured. Because as long as you have security vulnerabilities or CVs, there are always risks. And then you need to do testing from top to bottom or bottom to top as well. Yet, that's not all. That was for one cloud. But in the long run, what you have is actually more than one. Often organizations start on a public cloud because there's clearly a shortage on cloud computing. And then they move towards prem or they productize their AIML projects on prem. So they have end up having hybrid cloud scenarios or multi-cloud scenarios that they need to address with the same performance or the same level of operational excellence. 
which I think we've made quite clear is a difficult process. So what can you do to, to tackle the problem? So you start at point A, you need to reach operational excellence, you're a company. You have, so we're not supposed to give advice, but you have two options, ignore them or tackle them. Don't. You need to tackle them, right? How do you tackle them? There are two options depending on use cases, self-management and managed services. And this is more or less where we're going to dive a little bit deeper into how to address those options depending on your use case. Um, let's look a little bit at self-management. Obviously, as product manager for managed services, you're gonna expect me to say, oh, it's terrible, don't do it, right? Absolutely not. Self-management is not impossible, it's not too hard, it has plenty, plenty, plenty of very good use cases, but what will generally happen is that if you need a certain amount of engineers to innovate, you'll probably need 25% more of those just to keep a level of operational excellence stable. So it requires an allocation of about 25 to 35% of engineers. Obviously, the right engineers, very skilled engineers on your skill set at the moment to operate that. Now, Andrea has a little scoop on the industry, and I found that this morning, but there is a joke amongst LMLOps engineers that sometimes this number goes up to 80%. But generally speaking, in a moment of time where this engineering resource is specialized into everything that they're operating, so they don't need to spend time training, retraining, rehiring, whatnot, 25% will do. It's more than doable for, uh, for a company that's growing. When it comes to managed services, the process is a little bit different. So right now, you're self-managing everything, right? So your models and applications, your infrastructure and operation are all covered by your team when, when, in, in whichever uh, proportion that we did, just, just like last time. With a managed service, a provider will come in and kind of extend your workload. They will take over the infrastructure and operations part through their own expertise of in-house engineers, and they will cover it completely, depending on your requirements, and then you as a company starting up will have more space to accelerate innovation by focusing on your models and on your applications. How does this look in action? Engineers that don't need to spend time on operations actually get to focus on number one, what they enjoy, and number two, what they're there to really do, which is drive innovation. I think of it like kind of having the lights on, right? You need lights on to innovate so you can write and see and whatever. Having the lights on will not really lead to the innovation, but you will not be able to innovate in the dark. And there are a couple of benefits to this. Number one, harmonious ecosystem. So we talked about the plethora of tools, we talked about the plethora of infrastructures. Generally, when addressing a managed service, it is essential to get a provider that allows you to harmonize your ecosystem and reach a cohesive level of operational excellence on the entire infrastructure. This materializes in a hybrid and multi-cloud approach that allows you to operate within any cloud environment so that your infrastructure can be liberated to, um, uh, to adopt all the benefits of, of both options. Generally speaking, people ask if, if managed services cut, cuts costs. Sometimes it does, there are cases when it doesn't, but what it definitely does is it increases cost predictability. There, is a lot, a lot of costs associated, uh, unknown costs associated with self-management because sometimes engineers leave, they need to retrain, they need to be rehired and hired and the team grows and all of a sudden they need to take care of something else and those are unpredictable, right? So you think it's gonna cost you this much to operate this environment, as a matter of fact, it'll cost you a little bit more. With a managed service, that's not the case because generally, it should be measured and priced based on an infrastructure metric. So you'll pay for as much operational excellence as your infrastructure needs. It covers the skill gap and it also offers engineers, and, and, and I talked about this before, but I like to say that it really honors the engineering skills. I think as an MLOps engineer, you know, you train to bring artificial intelligence to new levels and you come and you're ready to bring it to new levels and hang in, you need to update it. Um, it, it allows them, it liberates them to, to, to focus more on innovation, right? And this materializes in an accelerated time to market that is essential in the fiercely competitive field at the moment. What does the right managed service provider look like? That's MSP right there, a cute little acronym for you. Uh, there are a couple of things you need to keep in mind when even analyzing this, right? So when you say, let me look at some, at some managed service providers, number one, they need to have experience with your, the products that you're trying to use. Now, that experience doesn't need to be decades because artificial intelligence at this level 
it's growing and it's, it's, it's relatively novel, but it needs to have some level of experience and trust. You need to make sure that they have the resources necessary to manage those environments. What do resources look like? People, headcount, infrastructure. And also they need to have the efficiency to do it, which is generally backed by an SLA. When it comes to their processes, they need to be really transparent and they need to cover everything within your stack. Studies have shown that a managed service provider that covers only part of the stack and that leaves even a small part of the stack for you to self-manage ends up costing you considerably more. And it ends up making your engineers a little bit more confused because they don't know what causes what and then the managed service provider says, well, no, this caused that and this caused that so we can't fix it. It needs to cover everything, right? The full stack. They need to be proactive, meaning they don't need to wait for you to tell them something is wrong. They need to have methods to tell you that something is wrong. And speaking of methods to tell you things, they need to be completely transparent into what they're doing. So monitoring, logging, absolutely everything. You must know everything that the provider is doing on your infrastructure and you must have a complete log of it for auditing purposes. When it comes to commercial viability, we can't skip it. I'm business school trained, sorry. Um, there needs to be some level of intuitive pricing that allows you to really predict and budget. What does this look like? Like I said, a unit of infrastructure. So that can be per node or per database unit or a percentage of your underlying public cloud infrastructure, right? But it needs to be something that you can measure and predict. I'm gonna use this much in this year, it'll cost me this much, period. Regardless of whether, you know, eventually we end up needing more engineers and the managed service provider needs to hire more, that's up to them. You need to know exactly how much it costs. And also, once you're ready, once you've learned how to manage, you need to have handover options. The provider must allow you to go on from the managed service and really take over the operations on yourself when you're ready. That means no lock-in. So if you want to at any moment step away, you should be able to do so. If you say, I have the expertise now, you should be able to walk away without any loss to your data, without any loss to your processes. When do we choose which? Okay, so a managed service provider is useful for the companies that are looking to start up in the AI field, are looking to be very quick to market, they're looking at speed, innovation, growth, VC backed, we need to grow hundreds and hundreds of percentages in, in, in the next couple of years, right? We're not necessarily tech-centric, so we're not gonna provide infrastructure solutions ourselves, but we're looking to leverage AI into the business world, into the larger business world. Or, you are a company that's large in a specific market that's not necessarily tech-centric. Pharma, telco, automotive, and you're looking to adopt the power of AI. Again, you need to be quick, you need to be innovative, and you need to grow very quickly within that environment. Managed service providers would be a good choice in that circumstance. If you're looking at a high level of confidentiality and you're very interested in building in-house expertise in operational excellence in AI, self-management is a better choice. If you're also looking to grow into tech-centricism, and by this I mean providing solutions for other customers that will allow them to reach operational excellence, then definitely self-management is the way to go. If you're basically looking to give tools that have operations to other customers, then it's best that you learn to manage your own tools. At Canonical, my motto when I took over has changed to, we mind your ops, you mind your business. Managed services is a way that liberates your engineering team to innovate and focus on what really matters. And with that said. That was it, I guess. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, and if you want to talk about AIML, MLOps, open source, or managed services, we are probably a step away, or we, you can connect with us on LinkedIn as well. It would be a pleasure to connect. Thank you Thank for you. coming. Do we have questions, actually, or do we have time for questions? I don't know. I think we have a few minutes, but... Do we have questions? Oh, oh. Okay, yes. an ideal amount of service in what way? I can, so, yeah, so, so when it comes to managed services, there are, there are different levels available there, right? So you've got the, the large system integrators that provide kind of everything, any sort of operation or managed service available. Then you have managed services coming from the tools themselves. So you will have open source developers that provide managed services for their own tools. 
And then you have managed service providers in the IT world, which are companies like Canonical. Depending on your use case, you are able to select any of those, right? We cater to what we said before. So companies looking to adopt AI into, into their growth or startups looking to grow significantly. And I might want to add one thing here is that organizations or what organizations often appreciate is that we can manage the whole stack. Um, in general, you have companies specialized in managing Kubernetes only or managing a part of the ML platform, and then it ends up to having way too many contracts, which for an organization, especially if it's large, it can be very challenging as well. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Okay, then. Oh. Great to know we're so clear. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Have a good event.